This is module 5.3, pedigrees and karyotypes. So we're going to look at what a karyotype is and do one. We're going to identify what's abnormal about karyotypes. We're going to learn about how to do pedigrees and then do some. This is in chapters 10 through 17 again in your textbook. You can skip most of 11 and all of 13. It's a real brief part of uh, this genetic section. So karyotype is basically taking the chromosomes out of a cell and staining them and then trying to match them up. It's actually kind of hard because you can imagine how small they are. And so they're using fluorescent scopes and better scopes now to do it digitally. But they used to literally stain the cells and then take a picture and then sometimes cut the picture out and match them up. So you find both number, the pair of 1, 2, all the way down to 23. Usually, in order to do this, the cells have to be actively dividing. Because remember, most of the time the cell DNA is in the form of chromatin, and it won't stain. You can't really see anything. So it allows, it's a real rudimentary, maybe, way of looking at genetic abnormalities. It's not like you're looking at individual genes. You're looking at individual chromosomes. So you can tell if you have a matched pair for each set. You can count the number to see if there's extra. And you could tell if one was broken or damaged somehow. So this is a picture of a normal karyotype here. And you can see they have 22 pairs and then the X and the Y. Here's a pretty one that they have used fluorescent dyes to look at and notice that there's three of number 21. Okay, so that's never good. Um, this would somebody would be somebody with Down syndrome, very apparent uh, that there's an extra chromosome there. Okay, so we'll be doing a little bit of karyotyping in class. The other thing we're going to be doing is pedigrees. And this is something a genetic counselor might sit down with two parents if they're worried about a particular genetic disease that could be carried down through the generations that maybe mom had or grandma had, and they want to know what the odds that their children um, would have this or carry a particular trait. So it's a little bit, it's used to predict the odds. Now, nowadays we can do genetic testing and we can tell whether a person is a carrier or had the trait. So between the two things, they could really figure out, you know, what are the odds of having a child that would carry that trait. So you should remember that a trait is something you see or is an express uh, that a person has, like a widow's peak or curly hair or blue eyes. Uh, but also can be things like sickle cell anemia or cystic fibrosis or other diseases. All the genes um, that you have in your body are, there, are either autosomal or they're sex-linked genes. They would be carried on the XY. So on chromosomes 1 through 22, those are autosomal genes. And carried on the X or Y chromosome, it would be a sex-linked uh, gene. All the versions of a gene are the alleles. In pea plants, there were two alleles, for example, for flower color, one for white, one for purple. Um, for people, we have several genes that have just two alleles. A widow's peak is one. Um, ear lobes attached or free. Um, freckles. Um, dimples. Um, whether when you fold your hands as if you were praying, which thumb is on top? Left thumb is dominant, for example. Okay. Organo organisms are going to uh, inherit a copy of this gene from both parents, one from each parent. And whichever one is expressed is considered the dominant form. And if you don't have either dominant copy, either allele for the dominant gene, um, you're going to show the recessive uh, phenotype. Oops, went too far here. So, how to read a pedigree. A square means male and a circle means female. If it's colored in, it carries the trait or has the trait that you're talking about. And you could draw a pedigree about freckles if you wanted to, but most often they're done 
with diseases or disorders or something that some trait that might cause a health problem. If there's a line between two, those two people made it. If there's a line straight down from a mating, the, those are the offspring. Usually it's drawn from left to right, oldest to youngest. So in this case, the daughter was born before the son. If there's a triangle and a line connecting offspring, those are identical twins. If the line is not between the two, those are non-identical twins. So in this picture over here, the oldest generation is on the top. The mating between the father and the mother who has Huntington's disease resulted in four children, a daughter, son, son, and son. The da oldest daughter, or the oldest, which is the only daughter, and the youngest son also carried the, the trait, so had Huntington's disease. Only one of their children uh, had any offspring, so they, well, sorry, the second son had an offspring, and the last son also had uh, three kids, so they have four grandchildren. This would be the parent generation, then F1 and F2, or generation two. Okay, and so this couple, the son and his wife, um, you also see the genotype or the some of the pedigree of of his wife and that family, at least in this, these two, do not carry the Huntington's uh, disease. Okay, so looking at a pedigree, could you tell whether whatever is being traced is dominant or recessive? If it's autosomal dominant and one parent has it, there's a 50-50 chance that the kid is going to have the disease as well. So if they had four children, odds are half of them would carry it. So that's one way to look at a pedigree and know whether it's autosomal dominant or recessive. Because recessive isn't going to show up nearly as often as a dominant. So the offspring have a 50% chance of carrying or inheriting that trait. If it's recessive, then both, if, if both parents have to be affected in order, um, both parents don't have to be affected, but both parents have to carry the trait in order for a child to be affected. So in some cases, you can have two parents that don't show the trait and a kid that does. You're never going to see that in dominant, autosomal dominant. In autosomal recessive, though, you can have a kid that has it when parents do not. So this is an example of autosomal dominance. In generation one, the dad has the trait, whatever this is. The trait in this one is hypercholesterolemia. So he's got high cholesterol. They had five children, three of them also have high cholesterol. Child number one, the son here, had two kids. And again, 50% of his kids, he had two and one of them is got high cholesterol. In this case, neither parent carry the gene, none of the children do. The last one, the daughter who has high cholesterol, she uh, had five, four children with number seven here, and two of their children have high cholesterol. Again, about 50% each time um, of the offspring carry the trait. In autosomal recessive, first of all, there's not as many but there's one person that carries it. Now, parent one and two up here in generation one, both of them must carry the recessive allele. So if this was denoted by the letter M, for example, this person would have a big M and a little M, and so would his mate, number two. This kid got the little M's from both parents, the little M sperm and the little M egg and so ended up with the disease or with the, the trait, whatever it was. But unless number one carried it, odds are none of their children would be affected. In X-linked inheritance, um, the sons are going to be always affected because the Y chromosome doesn't carry the, the trait at all. So if a son, if there, a son is born and gets, gets uh, the X with the trait on it, they're going to be affected. 
But it's never going to be passed from father to son because if dad has it, he's passing Y's to his sons, not X's. Okay. So the, while the boys might be more likely to be affected uh, for X-linked inheritance, they can't pass it to their sons. They can only pass it to their daughters. All the daughters of an affected male are going to be affected because he's got only one X to get, or he's going to give daughters only an X, and they all carry the trait. In this one, it is X-linked dominant, so no matter what mom has, the daughters are going to, going to be affected. So here's a, a man that carries it. All of his daughters are affected. And none of his sons, because he passes the Y on to the son. So this daughter has uh, uh, an X chromosome that carries the trait. So anybody she gives an X to, about half of her children, are going to be affected. And sure enough, about half of all of these daughters' children are affected. And this son, this son, and this son, if they were to mate, and number 14 did, all of the daughters are affected. Number 7 did, all the daughters are affected. Okay. This is an example of X-linked recessive disorder. And this is the royal family of England. And Queen Victoria up here, the Queen of England from 1819 to 1901, was a carrier of this trait but it's carried on the X chromosome. So her son, Leopold, was affected. Okay. Her daughter, Alice, and her daughter, Beatrice, were carriers. Leopold uh, lived long enough to have children, and Alice, one of his daughters, was a carrier, and they know this because Rupert had the disease. They don't know about this other son. Beatrice was a carrier, so her Two of her sons, out of the three that she had, were affected. Unlikely, or likely they didn't live long enough to reproduce because hemophilia, there was no treatment at this time, of course. However, Eugenia was a carrier, and Eugenia had one, two, three, four, five, six kids, and two of her sons were also affected. Over here, and this is probably the famous one, is Alice was a carrier, and Alice um, gave it to her daughter, Alex, and Alex married the Tsar of Russia, Nicholas. And their daughters didn't carry it. Again, it's more likely to affect sons, but Alexei did. And there's the whole Anastasia thing. There's the daughter that they thought maybe survived and did not. But you might have heard of the story um, and how they tried to treat Alexei to keep him alive because they knew he was a bleeder. Hemophilia makes you bleed because you don't have clotting factors. Interesting side note to this pedigree is that this daughter over here um, had four kids and the oldest daughter married a son who if you go back far enough were related the royal family had rules about who they could marry they could only marry royalty so there's a little bit of inbreeding here a couple generations down but still George and this daughter here mated and Prince Philip Andrew Edward uh, Princess Anne and etc that's Queen Elizabeth, she's still alive. So, Prince Charles here, which will be the next King of England, maybe. <laughs> There's a little bit of inbreeding. So, looking at this pedigree, can you tell uh, which one this is? Is it autosomal dominant, autosomal recessive, or X-linked recessive? And you should say recessive right away because there's two people in it that don't have parents that are effective. So you know it's recessive. Okay. And it's likely X-linked recessive because the males are the ones that are affected every other generation. All right, so we will do this in lab. Try to see if you can draw this pedigree. Carol and Larry are the first generation and they had five children. The five children are Larry, Susan, Michelle, Angie, and, sorry, Larry is colorblind. That's the dad. Susan, Michelle, 
Angie, Larry Jr., and Scott are the five children. And then it lists the children that, um, that they had. See if you can draw the pedigree and color in the circles of the people who are affected. See if you can figure this out. We will do this together in class uh, and draw it, all, draw it out on a piece of paper or a board and see how you do. So given a karyotype, could you uh, interpret it? Could you determine if it was X, um, male or female, looking at the X and Y chromosome? Given a pedigree, could you read it and interpret it? Or could you draw one out given some information? Maybe you'd like to draw one from your own family with a particular trait. And you don't have to pick a disease. You can pick, you know, fun funky looking noses or something. Or, you know, a trait that might be, that you notice has passed down through your family. Anyway, that is the end of this particular module.